Now that we've learned quite a bit about gender stereotypes and the different forms of sexism, let's transition to focusing on the impacts. For example, how might these gender stereotypes and forms of sexism affect hiring decisions? What happens when who you are doesn't match people's gender stereotypes and gender role attitudes? There are many different ways we could take this discussion, but in this video we'll focus on Alice Eagley's role congruity theory and the consequences of being counter-stereotypical. We'll also focus on how we can use these ideas to explain the discrimination affect paradox that we learned about in a previous video. Role congruity theory proposes that people observe men and women in their social roles and from those observations draw conclusions about the characteristics of men and women. So it's not that innate biological gender differences lead to people engaging in different roles, but rather that the different roles people engage in lead to observed gender differences. That was a mouthful, so let me reiterate. It's the order of operations that differs here. According to the theory then, gender differences don't lead to different roles, but rather different roles lead to gender differences. For example, if society encourages women to engage in more nurturing activities, for example, child rearing or whatever, and society encourages men to engage in more competitive activities, like being the breadwinner, being a business-oriented man, this may lead women to become more nurturing, and it may lead men to become more competitive or industrious or whatever, all these communal versus agentic traits that we learned about before. The idea here is that to completely discharge their roles, girls need to learn nurturance and dependence, whereas boys need to learn assertiveness and ambition. When the roles are switched, so too are the gender differences, encouraging us to believe that it's not biological or innate. One study, for example, found that men who were single parents were equally as nurturing as mothers. Role congruity theory can also explain gender-based employment discrimination. For example, uh, Lori Rudman and colleagues in 2012 conducted a meta-analysis of six different experiments that all used a similar hiring paradigm, a man and a woman interviewing for a leadership position. When the applicants had communal traits, both the man and the woman were seen as equally likable. At the same time, however, the men were rated as more competent and more hireable. When the applicants had agentic traits, women and men were rated as equally competent, but women were now seen as less likable and less hireable. So no matter what characteristics they exhibited, women were less likely to get the job. The women in this study were sort of in a catch-22 quote, disqualified based on perceived incompetence if they acted femininely, or due to backlash if they act, uh, if they displayed agency, right? So either way, they were sort of disqualified. Uh, so again, a catch-22. And what happens when women break through these barriers and despite communal stereotypes, engage in a high-status role that's typically thought to be agentic? while well, they face a host of hostile stereotypes, and I'm specifically referring to hostile sexism, which we'll refer back to in just a moment. What you're looking at here, for example, is a list of the top 10 stereotypes of powerful women, taken from a 2011 Forbes article that interviewed many of the world's most powerful women and simply asked them, what is your least favorite stereotype about powerful women? So here you can clearly see the effects of being counter-stereotypical. People are referring to these powerful women as conniving, emotional, angry, uh, tough and weak at the same time, which I think is really interesting, uh, masculine, single and lonely, all of these stereotypes that just aren't necessarily true. To delve just a little bit deeper here, how does role congruity theory and the idea of being counter-stereotypical interact with the different forms of sexism that we learned about in our previous video? Well, those holding benevolent sexist beliefs view women who occupy traditional roles, such as being a homemaker or a mother, in positive terms. Because these roles are associated with the general social category women, for example, such benevolent sexist beliefs lead women to being uh, seen in positive terms in general. But what about women who embrace non-traditional roles? As we just saw, hostile sexist beliefs now become important. 
People endorsing hostile sexist beliefs view some women, such as those who occupy non-traditional roles specifically, as direct th uh, threats excuse me, to male status and power, and they dislike those women because of it. According to Glick and Fisk in 2001, the coupling of negative reactions toward non-traditional women, those hostile sexist beliefs, with positive reactions toward traditional women, those benevolent sexist beliefs, results in the dual strategies of rewarding appropriate behavior and punishing inappropriate behavior. As a result, women are locked into a limited set of social roles at the same time that they are the recipients of liking and admiration. If this sounds familiar, it's because it is. This distinction between hostile and benevolent sexism, then, can at least in part also explain the discrimination affect paradox that women experience that we discussed in a previous video. So just to wrap up, I encourage you to think through the admittedly complicated interconnections between ambivalent sexism, role congruity theory, and the discrimination affect paradox as we progress.